Okay, so we do have a lot to get through. So I think I'll get I'll get rolling on the presentation. And as mentioned, that you can always send through any questions you've got to info at johnmonash.com. Um, but please, please do make sure that you're um, sort of paying attention throughout as, as it's very likely that we might answer your question along the way. And if that's the case, we won't be readdressing those at, at the end because we are trying to work through a lot of content. Uh, so you can also see on the screen there, um, my details, Alexandra Coelli, I'm the Scholarships Coordinator at the John Monash Foundation. I'm always more than happy to help with further queries you might have or anything you can think of after this session. Um, something to sort of start us off with is our scholarship selection is completely externally run. So it's, um, it means you have the opportunity to, to seek out um, help from the foundation along the way. So please don't hesitate to do so. So briefly for anyone who might have just joined or else has not con actually commenced in an application at this stage, um, or maybe this is the first of you heard of the foundation in which when you received an email from the university, which could be possible, but the General Sir John Monash Foundation uh, raises funds and administers the John Monash scholarships. Um, we award 15 to 20 scholarships each year to exceptional individuals from all fields of endeavor um, who wish to pursue a postgraduate degree uh, overseas um, as a part of a greater vision for the betterment of Australia. So for that reason, that is why you'll see a, a picture of a General Sir John Monash on your screen at the moment. Obviously, um, obviously this picture is, of Monash is very relevant as not only is he the namesake of the foundation, but our scholars are selected on the basis um, that they possess somewhat similar qualities of leadership. So this sort of brings me to a very important um, tip to, to mention. The fact that we actually named the John Monash Foundation is relevant to applying for our scholarship. Uh, so you should consider what leadership means as an applicant for our scholarship um, in the vein of John Monash. And I think there actually is an application question that regards this, and it's something that you should take time and, and reflect on when, when answering. I think this quote that's on screen is, is probably a good, a good sort of starting point in terms of that consideration. And, and you can um, also find this on our website if, if you are interested, but I would certainly say it's important to keep in mind that um, the John Monash Foundation does have some relevance in, in completing an application for a John Monash scholarship. So what are the key things that define our scholarship? I'll run through these very quickly as it's more for the benefit of anyone who has not yet started the application, but the priority is to move on to the application details and, and frequently asked questions in more details. So we're uniquely Australian, so established in Australia for Australian citizens for the benefit of um, Australia more broadly. Um, we're open for people of all ages and from all fields of endeavour. Uh, we're not restricted by where you would like to study as long as you can demonstrate why it is the best place in the world for you to be um, to assist in achieving this proposed benefit you have for Australia. So what is the foundation looking for in a strong applicant for the John Monash Scholarship? So one of those things is demonstrated um, excellence within your field. This could be academic excellence or it could be a myriad of other things. Uh, you'll notice in completing the application that we don't have a minimum GPA requirement for the scholarship, but uh, that's mostly because we don't wish to limit our application strictly by that. Um, you don't need to have completed um, first class honours to apply or have only received a certain GPA as mentioned. However, there is an expectation that your grades will indicate that you're able to get into your postgraduate study that you're proposing. Um, this brings me to another important tip for anyone who might find this relevant to them. If you have aspects of your transcript that are particularly perhaps not outstanding, you should be prepared to explain why. Um, use this as an opportunity to expand your narrative and clarify your ability to take on, take, take on this postgraduate study. So the demonstrated leadership ability. Leadership's a, a huge concept, um, and I'm sure it pops up in, in many, many of these post, postgraduate scholarship applications. However, you should not let yourself be intimidated by it when you're trying to tackle this in your application for the John Monash Scholarship. Leadership can be demonstrated in such a myriad of ways, depending on who you are and what it is that you actually do. So try and think about this more broadly um, in terms of leadership being both traditional, perhaps 
you know, in, in sorts of, uh, you know, perhaps you have had leadership roles in, in various parts of your professional life, but there's also subtler and more soft types of leadership that you can think about how you can evidence this throughout your application. So it might be through your professional life, personal or academic. Um, any major concerns about sort of demonstrating this in your application, you're more than welcome to uh, reach out to me personally by email. Those details are at the start. However, I'll, I'll pop them up again at the end. Uh, thirdly, a vision which will be of a benefit to Australia. So this is quite vital. Essentially, applicants that don't hit this marker are not perhaps going to be progressed any further. Um, the proposed pathway you're undertaking with this postgraduate study needs to be a part of a bigger picture that has a greater benefit than your own career advancement, for example. So this brings me to a really important tip that will be invaluable throughout the application process and interviews, should you be shortlisted to that next stage. Don't be vague with what this vision is and what the benefit is for Australia. Yeah, be clear about what the proposed benefit is and make it consistent throughout your narrative of your application. Because if it doesn't come across clearly, it's very unlikely that your application will go any further. So another tip on this point is I often have people asking, um, they find it quite difficult to, to sort of propose, to really articulate this benefit if they come from a field of study that's much more theory based. And this is very understandable. It can be quite daunting uh, to think about how you might put forth your benefit for Australia up against the likes of perhaps someone in human rights law or medical research. Um, however, I really encourage you not to be deterred by this because we do have our applicant applications open to people of all field of endeavour and that's for, that's for a reason. We're looking for great minds of all fields and, and, and to invest in Australia's future in that way. So as long as you're able to be clear on your goal and vision, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to explain it um, and deliver it with confidence. So keep, keep in mind the benefit to Australia could be affecting change in your field of study. So that's important to, to keep in mind in context of, of a really theoretical based field. Um, and also it's important to keep in mind that applications at the shortlisting stage, the online review stage, will be assessed by professionals relevant to your field of proposal. So you don't have to worry about uh, the online reviewer not understanding the context of your application. Um, then we have a few eligibility requirements um, to keep in mind as you do need to tick all three of these to be able to actually submit an application and have it considered. Um, the first is Australian citizenship. Secondly, you must have completed or will have completed by 2019 a degree from an Australian university. Um, I've sort of put a little asterisk next to outstanding results and instead I would say with results that indicate you will be able to get into and complete your postgraduate study. Um, and finally, to be eligible in this round, you must be planning to start your postgraduate degree at any stage in 2019. So further clarification on that start date, 2019, as it's a very frequent question we get. Um, if you're commencing in 2018, even if it's September, October, you're not eligible to apply in this round, unfortunately. You have to be commencing at some stage throughout 2019, and that might be as late as you know, October next year. Um, but that's sort of how the scholarship rounds work. You apply for the year before you would actually start your postgraduate degree. So any stage throughout 2019, then you're eligible to apply in this round. And also just on the point of um, a postgraduate degree at an overseas institution, uh, the degree has to be a postgraduate degree. It can be your first postgraduate uh, degree of study or you can already have completed a postgraduate degree and be applying for another one. Um, both are fine. So what do you get if you're successful in obtaining the scholarship? Um, this is probably particularly important uh, for those of you who are already completing an application and might be looking for tips regarding the budgeting section. Um, it is a stipend of 70,000 per year for up to three years, um, plus additional support for one return flight to and from the location of study. Uh, this means that the three years of funding is measured by the length of your postgraduate degree at a full-time study load. So a one-year master's is only eligible for, for one year of funding of 70,000 for the year. Um, a two years would get two years of 70,000, 
a PhD would be eligible for three years of funding. Uh, this figure is set regardless of the degree cost. So the funding can be used to support your studies at, the, at your own discretion. So it might be used on tuition, living expenses, accommodation, um, travel to and from relevant parts of you know, research that you're conducting. Uh, you can also hold the scholarship concurrently with other sources of income, including other awards and grants, bursaries, etc. Uh, the amount this funding covers for a scholar will really depend on where they're studying. For example, a scholar doing a PhD in Europe will receive the same three years of funding as a scholar doing their PhD at Cambridge or Harvard. Um, in Europe, the degree could be free or cost far less, depending on, when you're, on where you're going. And comparatively, if you went to the US, the 210000 in total might not cover the total cost of your tuition over three years. Um, so we ask. So essentially, this, what this funding covers will, will really vary greatly between applicants. And that's a part of the reason that we ask applicants to complete a breakdown of their expenses required for their proposed postgraduate study, uh, including all living expenses. It also shows if an applicant has given serious consideration to the realities of the postgraduate journey abroad, and also some confidence in the fact that you'll be able to manage it financially and complete your studies comfortably. Uh, use this question on the application about cost and budget to show you've done a bit of research and look up the expected living expenses for the city you plan on living in. You can find this online. A rough estimate is fine in that regard. Uh, work out if there is any shortfall um, between the scholarship and the total expenses that are expected per year. And if so, explain on how you plan on covering it. Um, as a side note, we do actually have three... Um, agreements with three sorry, institutions abroad, i.e. Madrid, King's College London and Cranford in the UK. Uh, these institu institutions offer an additional fee waiver um, for a John Monash scholar that wishes to study there. There are some additional restrictions, which you'll see at the moment on the screen. Um, however, if you're particularly interested in any of these three um, institutions, I would suggest getting in touch with me directly. I'm happy to discuss it in more detail if they are on your list of uh, preferred institutions. Um, outside of the financial support of the scholarship, the foundation um, and the alumni group of John Monash Scholars, 165 of them now, become a lifelong support network. Uh, you'll have contacts around the globe, be invited to interesting and dynamic alumni events in Australia and overseas. Uh, the relationship does not have an expiry date once you finish the postgrad study. Majority of our scholars remain very involved with the foundation and organize events around the globe together, collaborate on research, assist each other personally and professionally. So it's a very valuable network to become a part of. So on to the application process. Firstly, it does run over a large portion of the year from when applications open in May to when we announce the scholars formally each year, um, either December or, or late November at the earliest. Um, and that's hence why we require that applicants uh, are commencing their study overseas in the following calendar year. So applications, as you know, are currently open and remain open until the 1st of August. But however, to be considered in this round, please make sure that you submit your application by the 31st of July, by no later than a minute to midnight. Essentially, because the applications close on the 1st of August, that does not mean they're open for the entirety of the day on the 1st of August. So please make sure you've submitted them and late applications, unfortunately, will not be considered. Just on the application process again, sorry, I just thought I'd sort of give a bit of a numbers breakdown. It can be um, interesting to sort of keep this in mind. Each year we will receive anywhere between 300 to 350 applications. And after the online shortlisting process, about 100 of these will go to our state and territory interviews. We do interview in every state and territory around Australia, plus one panel conducted by video conference for any applicants who will be overseas during the state interview round. Uh, if you're curious about these dates, they're listed in full on the applications page of our website. Um, so essentially of that 100 that go to the state and territory interviews, about 40 will go to the national interviews, which are held in Sydney and Melbourne each year. The dates this year are 15th and 16th of October in Melbourne and 18th and 19th in Sydney. Uh, after the national interviews, we'll award between 15 and 20 scholarships. 
So the scholarship recipients are formally announced, uh, as mentioned, late November, early December of each year, and the, this happens with a formal ceremony at the uh, at the Sydney Opera House. As mentioned, it's a very long process. Uh, so the benefit of being involved, though, is there is feedback available for you throughout the entire process. So you only need to reach out and ask for it. So if you think about it, best case scenario is that you could come away with a scholarship of 70000 a year um, to help you go overseas and study and achieve the greater goal. And then worst case scenario is the opportunity to get some valuable feedback for some professional and personal development. So for those that are just commencing an application, or even if you are sort of in the midst of one at the moment, uh, this is an overview of everything that's required. Uh, there is a general information section which includes, you know, your name, contact details, proof of citizenship, a short bio. You can write it in the first or third person. People do tend to ask that as long as it's well written. I'm not too fast. Uh, proposed postgraduate studies. So you need to have, uh, you need a list, your first and second preference for your postgraduate study and where. Um, that's where you'll also be uploading a budget and the months that you plan on commencing your study in 2019. You also have an academic summary section, which is mostly to list any relevant transcripts. Uh, work experience, which includes a short CV plus a section to list any relevant awards, publications, exhibitions, etc. And there will also be a short statement where you can list any other professional achievements if you'd like to. Professional statements, uh, you have two main questions in that section. One's roughly 300 words and the other is 500. Uh, another section on leadership engagement and impact, again, uh, a more lengthier answer of 600 and another short answer of 300. Personal statements, which includes three main questions, roughly 300 words each. And then your referee request section, where you can fill out the details of a minimum of two referees and a third if you wish, and send them their requests to complete the, referees on your, the references on your behalf. So some things to keep in mind when you're writing an application. Some are very obvious, uh, such as read the instructions and the criteria. Uh, even more obvious is don't miss the deadline. You should always seek guidance wherever you can. Most universities actually have support available in writing applications. If you haven't written an application for a grant or a scholarship before, I strongly encourage you to reach out and find these um, resources. They're very, very helpful. Uh, you do need to be able to sell yourself and your vision somewhat, but the best way to do this is to deliver it with confidence and you'll be able to put yourself in good stead. Um, more importantly, be honest and genuine. It really does come across well in a written application. It's even more important at the interview stage. So on to the letters of reference. I thought I'd start, in this, uh, I'd start on this for the frequently asked questions because it is one that we get most often. So you need to have two references submitted with your application. Uh, they can be academic, professional, personal, or a combination of all three. Obviously, as we're open to people of all ages to complete the application, we expect that this combination of academic, personal, and professional will vary depending on the, on the applicant and the stage of their career. And this context is actually taken into account when an application is being assessed. Uh, you should select referees that know you well. As mentioned, you need to have two and you can have a third. Um, it's important that they can speak clearly about your leadership capacity or demonstrated ability um, with leadership. Um, and they can comment on your ability to manage the pressures of postgraduate studies. And really an academic, professional or personal referee should be able to make comment on that. You need to request these referees through the application platform, through the request tab. If you wish to submit a third referee, you need to activate this by clicking yes to the appropriate question in the general info tab. Um, after you've done this, a third option will become visible in the request section. Um, always speak to your referees, obviously, beforehand and make sure they're prepared to complete this for you and they're aware of the deadline. And you should also let them know that the reference request is going to come to them from um, admin at communityforce.com, which is the application platform. Um, it's very straightforward. It, it will just come to them as a, an email requesting they click a link and follow that. 
which actually brings me to probably my first um, yeah. frequently asked question. Um, so what will my referees be asked? They're essentially in that email given a link to go onto the, the platform themselves and they have to upload a letter of reference, one to two pages, quite standard. Um, there's also a short scaled metric in which they have to indicate um, on a one, scale of one to five uh, aspects of how they would refer you, I suppose, for the scholarship. Uh, things to keep in mind if you find the request is not working for whatever reason, if they haven't received it, please ask them to check their junk folder or perhaps just remind them again it's coming from admin at Community Force. They might be looking for an email from you. They might be looking for an email from John Monash Foundation. It's admin at Community Force. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that your browser version needs to be up to date, otherwise it might not be successfully sending them out. The platform has recently done an update and that does make a difference. Um, another question that we often get, is there a template for the proposed budget? Essentially, no. Uh, this question is more of an opportunity for you to, as mentioned earlier, show some maturity and it's a bit of consideration in, in the realities of your postgraduate study and how much that's going to cost. So it's, it's really an opportunity to show some initiative. And the best way to think of it is essentially, if I have 70,000 a year, but my costs of living are this much and the tuition is this much, how are you going to cover it? Showing a breakdown of these expenses is, is just a very valuable exercise for yourself, but it's also very helpful um, as a part of our scholarship application. So no, there is no template um, and that's fine. You can upload it as an Excel spreadsheet, as a you know, Word document, whatever you prefer, but um, please make sure that you put it into Australian dollars at the end. So another question, I'll be overseas during the state panels. How do I indicate this? Um, in your application under the general info section, there's a question that asks what your proposed address will be between, uh, I think it's 30th of August and uh, the, I think, yeah, 30th of August and 30th of September from memory. Um, I think it even mentions on there that it says that we use this to help uh, when it comes to allocating to the uh, state and territory panels, uh, but you should indicate there the state that you plan on being in and if you plan on being overseas you should definitely list an overseas address so that we're able to make sure that <coughs> sorry that you're allocated to the correct panel if you do progress to interview so if you're if you're going to be overseas on the date of say a new south wales um, panel and you live in new south wales then you should indicate um, your overseas address for that time so that if you do get an interview you're put onto the skype panel for example um, the postgraduate degree I'm proposing is different to my undergraduate field of study. Is that a problem? It's not a problem. It's not even that unusual as long as you're able to uh, evidence your capacity to make the change. So, for example, we have lots of people who might take on, a, you know, an MPP or an MBA after moving from maybe, a, you know, a different undergraduate area. Um, that's fine as long as you're able to really evidence your capacity to make that move and your experience, if it's not in an undergraduate capacity with, with grades, it ha you have to sort of evidence why it's a logical move for you as a part of this uh, greater, greater goal that you have. So where are the state and territories interviews held? You can, as mentioned, the dates are all listed on our website. Um, if you're interested, and it's probably worth looking them up um, in the case that you need to take off work or anything over that time um, with a bit of, uh, bit of prior knowledge. Um, however, where they're being held in every state and territory, the state ones are held at universities um, in major cities. So that's probably the best way to, to put it. And you, can, you probably won't find out about that until you've actually been granted an interview and then you get all the interviews, the details at that stage. So that brings me to another question, which is when will I hear if I'm successful in getting an interview? Um, you will hear at the earliest by the 24th of August. Um, and keeping in mind, if, you're, if you've indicated that you would be on the Skype panel or one of the earlier panels such as WA, then you would probably hear 
first. Um, later panels will hear after, but you will always have some time in advance to make sure you can organize yourself and, and get there and have the time off if it's for a Skype interview. Uh, Skype interviews, we try our best to make sure if you're overseas that we sort of time it to make it um, suitable both in Australia and wherever you are in the world um, as much as possible, but a bit of flexibility is, is appreciated as we have a lot of applicants overseas at the time of um, the Skype panel. So it's quite difficult to arrange all of them. Uh, the last question, am I eligible for the scholarship if I am completing a postgraduate degree in Australian university but on exchange? Um, short answer, no. Uh, you do need to be awarded your postgraduate degree from an overseas institution. However, you can be jointly awarded uh, your postgraduate degree by an Australian university and an overseas university. If you've got any questions about that, you can uh, get in touch with me directly and I can confirm whether or not um, your course is fine. Um, so I have not been accepted into my proposed degree. Is that a problem? No, it's not. <laughs> you, as mentioned, it's for a study commencing in 2019. So at any stage throughout 2019, which means that you may or not have been able to apply even by the time the scholarships are awarded. And that's, that is not an issue whatsoever. Most people, if they're starting in the fall semester in the UK or the US won't be applying until December, January. Um, so no, you do not need to be accepted to the course. You don't need to have even applied depending on where it is that you're planning on going. Um, I can't tell if my transcript is uploaded or anything similar with issues uploading to the platform. You can check this. If you go to your login screen and you have got all the tabs in front of you in the right hand side, there's a, there's a preview button. If you hit that, it will take you to the, a page where you're able to look at all of your answered questions in, in sequence and it'll show you if there's attachments added on and you'll be able to click them and see if they've, they've come up fine. Um, this brings me to the next question actually about worrying about if your applications have a lot of overlap or are repetitive and how the reviewer actually sees the application. It's actually, it, as mentioned, it doesn't look like as it does for you with the tabs, they'll be able to see it exactly as it looks in that preview button. So it's a long document. So if you're, if you're wanting to see how it looks for a reviewer and read it through in that way, which I strongly encourage you to do so, it's just by clicking that preview button. Uh, a question about if you have to put a second option for a postgraduate degree in institution, we strongly encourage you to do so. It's very important to have more than one option and they should both be excellent options. Um, so essentially it would be a very good idea to do so. Uh, it's a logical question if you were to progress to an interview, if you only have one option listed, you would be questioned on what if you didn't get into that option. So it's, it's good to have a second option, even a third if, if, if possible, but definitely list a second one. And in the section on why you've chosen it, it's worthwhile mentioning about the second option as well. Uh, can I put two separate master's degrees and apply for funding for both as long as it's under three years? This is quite a common question and it's a little bit of a tricky one to answer. Uh, essentially, no, you cannot put down two separate degrees, uh, even if it's under three years of funding. You can only apply for funding for an, a pathway that will be accessible through one application. So if, for example, you want to do an MPP followed by an MPA, if you have to apply separately for each of those degrees at two separate institutions, then you're not able to apply for funding for the two or three years. However, if it is a one plus one style masters plus another masters, such as um, the Oxford style, and it, there's a few other institutions that now have a similar setup. Um, if it is that style and it's actually through one application, so you're guaranteed entry into the second masters sequentially to, after completing the first, then you're eligible to put down that course structure. Um, any questions about that, I would encourage you to get in touch with me if you think that maybe you have a similar setup. Um, I would strongly encourage you to get in touch and we can discuss it in more detail. Uh, 
Another question here, will any preference be given for particular institutions? Uh, no, I think essentially we encourage applicants to apply to whatever institution is going to be the best for them, as long as it's uh, justified that it's the best place for you to be and the best place for you to get the skills you need to go about achieving this broader um, goal and vision for the betterment of Australian society, then that's what's important. There's no preference given to any sorts of institutions. We are very interested in seeing um, interesting applications and, and people considering institutions outside of um, your sort of, I suppose, more, more known ones. Uh, but that being said, sometimes the best place for you to go is going to be Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge um, and the like. So if it is the best place for you to be, that's what should be on your application and you should know why it's the best place for you to be. Um, wherever you're going, you should have given a lot of thought to why it is the best place for you to go and complete this postgraduate study. So I'll now move and see if there's any more questions that have come through. Yep, so we got a question about the support that's provided whilst uh, overseas during the postgrad study and opportunities to engage with other scholars. That's an excellent question. Um, we have scholars located in various locations throughout the world. Obviously there's larger groups established in the US on both the East and West Coast and then also in the UK. That being said, we do have some scholars in Asia and Europe as well. And so there's kind of a, a sort of alumni cohort established in, in those major regi regions. And, and there's plenty of opportunities to engage with other scholars, whether it be directly, if you are in one of those places, we're able to see them on a, on a regular basis. Um, we also have, as mentioned, uh, formal events that are organised and that sort of thing. But you are also sort of, once you're, once you're a part of the, the cohort, you, you have everyone's contact details. You're able to get in touch with people directly through the scholarship. Um, alumni committee, which, which will be there to help support you both on the ground and then, you know, um, as, a, as a larger cohort online. Um, the foundation also offers ongoing support. As mentioned, it never expires. You're a part of this, you know, sort of family as long as, as, long as you want to be engaged with it. And we give support in applying to wherever you would like to go study, obviously because of the timing. Um, as mentioned, you might be applying in December and you'll have been awarded a scholarship. So we're able to assist with letters of confirmation of funding, reference, that sort of thing, make it all as stress-free as possible. Um, but as mentioned, there's, there's ongoing support there with the foundation as well. Um, and in terms of engagement, plenty of engagement with, with other scholars, um, a whole sort of listing of 165 people to be in touch with, whether it be to formally talk about you know, common areas of research um, or maybe you want to talk to someone who went to the same institution as you and ask them some questions. Maybe you've got some research you're doing in Germany and you're looking for somewhere to stay. There's there a whole host, yeah, a whole host of um, reasons that you can get in touch with each other and obviously there's plenty of social events as well, um, organised formally and informally throughout the year. Um, and each, each major re region also has a Scholar Advisory Committee representative who's sort of there um, in a pastoral sort of nature as well to, if you have any major questions, put you in touch with other scholars. Um, so there's yeah, plenty of ongoing support from both the uh, foundation and the other scholars. Yeah, and obviously uh, afterwards you become a member of a large alumni committee and, and so you're always, always welcome at foundation events. And as mentioned, we've got a large symposium that we hold uh, every second year overseas and the interim in Australia and we encourage as many scholars as possible to to attend that and we also have a yearly events that happen in Melbourne and Sydney, Sydney mostly and those those events are obviously always open to scholars that are in town and scholars will also be kept in the loop of events that are happening uh, around the world as well. So I've just seen another question come through, um, wondering about eligibility uh, with just a three year undergraduate degree or if you have to have done honours. Um, as mentioned, it's not a requirement to have done an honours year. You just need to have completed 
um, your undergraduate degree um, or will have completed it by the time you plan on departing, obviously, for the postgraduate study abroad. Um, so honours year is not required unless it's a requirement of your own um, course, perhaps if you're doing, um, say, if you're doing a psychology degree. Yeah, essentially what's most important, um, if you've done a three-year undergraduate degree, you need to be confident that you're going to be able to get into the next stage of your postgraduate study without the honours and that your, obviously that your, your grades are, are strong enough to get in without the honours as well. As mentioned, it's not a requirement. You don't have to have, uh, you don't have, to have done your honours year, but you certainly um, should be able to evidence that you're capable of of taking on the, the postgraduate study. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit of academic maturity is, is very important to be able to evidence throughout your application. So I've seen that there's a few things coming through the chat as well. So a question about the audio breaking up. I've tested my speakers, so I'm guessing it could be something uh, at the other end, hopefully coming through reasonably clearly. Um, question about international exchange um, and during your undergraduate degree and should you upload a transcript for that? Uh, yes, you should. Um, if you're able to get the transcript from the overseas university you did the exchange to, that would be excellent and you should definitely try and get that as a priority, I suppose, um, before close of application. And it would be a very good idea to demonstrate that on your application. So do upload the transcript for your, any exchange you've had during the time of your undergraduate degree. Yeah, and if you can't get it in time, it's worth, it's worth uh, trying to uh, upload an unofficial transcript at the very least. And, and then if you do get an interview, you could always provide it ahead of time, um, as long as you can indicate something. And that's, that's definitely worthwhile doing. So based in New South Wales, but overseas for the interview period. Uh, I think we have kind of covered this, but I'm, oh, sorry, just arrived at the call, fair enough. Um, no, not a problem. If you're based in New South Wales, but you'll be overseas at the time that we're interviewing New South Wales, you should definitely list yourself as being overseas in the section in the general info um, tab of your application. So just list an overseas address hopefully relevant to where you actually will be because we will also work out interview times based on your time zone throughout the world. So, and that's for the Skype interviews, obviously. So when you're putting down your address in for the period of 30th of August to the 30th of September, and it does say on that part of the application, we will use this to allocate you to an interview. So just list overseas, Skype in brackets at the end of your um, address just so that uh, we're aware if you do get an interview that you need to be allocated to the appropriate Skype panel. A uh, question about if you've completed an Australian postgrad degree, is it possible to get scholarship for another postgrad? Absolutely. Um, we have had scholars that have already completed uh, various studies in Australia and they're going to do further postgrad studies overseas. They might have been um, you know, out in the workforce for several years and coming back to do some sort of postgrad study um, or you know, on a pathway directly. However, it's also fine if you're coming straight out of an undergraduate degree to then be going to your first postgrad study. Both are absolutely fine and yes, you can apply. Uh, regarding visas, you don't need to have your visa to the country in which you're planning on living in for your postgrad study at the time of application. Um, obviously, those sorts of things will happen um, depending on what when you start your studies in 2019. Uh, those things will happen a lot closer to um, yeah when you're applying to the institutions and being accepted and that sort of thing. You'll you'll also be able to get support with visa letters uh, through the foundation if you do 
get a scholarship, but it is not necessary to already have your visa at the time of completing an application. Um, regarding if you do get a scholarship, but then needing to postpone the commencement start date, um, essentially the best way to put this is if you apply now, it needs to be with the intention of starting your degree in 2019. Um, there's no applying with the intention of, of uh, postponing. Um, there's been cases where it's had to happen, but they're extreme sort of one-offs and they have to go through quite a, a process to do so. Um, and it's, it's on the basis of, you know, it's quite extreme circumstances. Um, so you should always apply and it should be with the intention of, of starting in 2019. Um, if, if you've got other sort of um, concerns about, about that question, please send me another email. We can talk about it in more detail. But yeah, that's the, the sort of short answer is, is no, you can't postpone it without any sort of uh, very uh, unique circumstances to do so. Um, question about what the panels entail. Uh, the panels are... They run for about, your interview will be about 20 minutes um, with sort of five minutes Q&A afterwards with the panel. There'll be between six and seven panellists on every panel um, made up of a variety of, of professionals in, from various fields of endeavour themselves or very um, high up in their various fields. And if you do get an interview, you'll actually receive um, a list of your panellists, including short bios on each of them. Uh, so you will be able to sort of prep yourself in advance. Uh, essentially, at the interview stage, anything about your application could be drawn out in more detail. So what your proposal is, uh, your sort of how you plan on achieving it, it, it's, it becomes more of a, an opportunity for the panellists to try and get to know you and your application a little bit better. And so, so you should be prepared to be able to speak to any aspect of your application in more detail at the interview stage. Um, question about uh, applying if you're still completing your undergrad this year. Yeah, it's fine if, you, as long as you plan on having completed it well in advance of starting your postgraduate degree, obviously, because it's probably a requirement. Um, again, it's, if the timing works out fine, then it's, it is fine to be completing your undergraduate degree in, in early 2019, but you should keep in mind that you have to really evidence in your applications to these overseas universities that you are ready to take on the, the pressures of postgraduate study. So um, again, it, it's about demonstrating the, the confidence of being successful in that postgrad um, study that will be important to, to our process and also to applying to those other universities. So it's something that we want to know when we're selecting scholars is that they're definitely going to get into these places. And that's because we can we can measure them on a, on a variety of, um, you know, academic capability and demonstrate leadership and, and all those things that are drawn out at the application interview and national interview stages. Um, but you should keep in mind that you also have to think about how you'll go about applying to these overseas institutions. And if you're still completing your undergraduate degree, how you're evidencing that you're going to be a conf confidently able to um, complete the degree. I'm just scrolling through for any other questions at the moment. Uh, proof of language efficiency for the scholarship. Um, we don't have, you don't have to upload um, any sort of documentation. Um, I suppose it will come across pretty naturally in, in the written application stage. Um, and and if, if you're able to sort of, you know, really articulate that bigger goal and vision for the betterment of society and, and have a clear narrative throughout, then, then I suppose that's the indicator of, um, of all that we need, um, whereas I suppose for applying for the, the postgraduate study, that might be a different story. You might actually need to upload um, 
sort of a, a level of English efficiency or, or wherever you're studying, it, it could vary. Um, those requirements are separate to ours um, and you would have to, I suppose, look them up yourself um, depending on where you plan on, on studying. Um, but as for the scholarship application, there is no uh, minimum language requirement, except that obviously the narrative of your application will be um, of, a, of a high standard. So at this stage, it looks like we've worked through most of the questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. If anyone has anything else they'd like to throw in the, the group chat or else email, more than happy to, to give it a minute or two more and, and answer any final questions. preference to location of study or is the question in regards to the the location of where you go study or where you yourself um yes where, you, where you're going to study um yes so there is there is uh, no preference given to where you go study it's as i said there's you know as long as it's justified as the best place um for for you to to be to to get the, the skills that you need for your specific proposal that you're making and if it's in you know latin america asia europe um us uk that that is up to you and if it's the important thing is that you've really shown why the institution that you're you're wanting to apply to is the best place to be then that's what's important and that's what makes for a strong application so as so there's there's always um there's always a variety each year and then there's often a tendency for many of them to be going to similar institutions. So it is interesting when we see a different one, um, but there is no preference given to um, the location of study and you can apply to anywhere. It's just got to be uh, the best place for you to be essentially. Uh, if you want to undertake postgrad study in 2020, then yes, you would be best to apply in the 2019 round. So it'll be called the 2020 application that will be open in May to August 2019. So yes, the, the next application round, if, if you plan on undertaking postgrad commencing in 2019. Uh, where you've completed your undergraduate degree, um, that's, there's no weight given to that. Um, as mentioned, uh, you need to complete your academic history and you upload your transcripts, but that's more uh, in terms of if you upload your transcripts, so we're able to, to be confident in an applicant being able to take on, take on postgrad study. Uh, so it's not, there's no preference given to where you completed the undergraduate degree. Um, the, the preference is to, is to be confident in applicants undertaking postgrad study and their ability to do so. So as long as that's evidence, then um, no, there's no, there's no issue if, if you didn't attend, I suppose, uh, a particular undergraduate, um, a, a particular institution to complete your undergraduate. Uh, applicants to get to the national panels or if, uh, I suppose, national panels are most relevant, um, obviously, if they're in Melbourne and Sydney and you live in Perth or you know, outside of any of those, those two cities, then uh, you will be given support from the foundation to get to your national panel interview. Um, you can expect that the, um, the foundation would be in touch with you if you get a national panel um, interview. And I'll just, I suppose on that topic, you can expect if you do a state or territory interview, a uh, face-to-face one or by Skype, uh, you will be notified within, you know, two days after your interview or two business days, I should say, after your interview, if you're, you know, if you're successful. Um, and then if that's the, if that's the case, then you can um, expect the foundation to be in touch to organise logistics in getting you to either Melbourne or Sydney for the national interviews. Obviously, if you're in Sydney, 
the preference would be that we would obviously allocate you to the Sydney National Panel. If you're in Melbourne, you'd be you know, put on the Melbourne National Panel so travel isn't required. Um, but if not, there will be support in getting you there. The preference as well, if you are overseas for the national interviews, the preference is that we like people for the nationals to interview in person as much as possible. Um, and uh, if you've got any queries about that, if you're concerned about being overseas at that time, you can always uh, get in touch and discuss further, but we do offer um, support to try and get everyone back as much as possible for the national interviews. Um, for the state ones, if, if it's, you know, as you mentioned, we have a whole panel put aside for people to interview by Skype, so that's not an issue. Um, however, other travel around getting to the panels, such as if to and from the airport or if you live not in Melbourne CBD, that sort of travel is covered um, by the applicant. Um, panelists and whether they expect you to have made connections with academics to the institutions you're applying for. Um, not necessary. If, if, for example, you do um, already have a relationship with an academic lined up for a potential supervisor, that's excellent. You should definitely indicate that is the case. However, it is not necessary or expected that applicants will have done that. If, if you have, it could be because or you've already done some overseas um, study at that institution and had the chance to make that connection, which is absolutely excellent, excellent and you should indicate it, but panelists won't expect to see that, nor will reviewers at the online review stage. And yeah, it's, it's um, obviously for people doing a PhD, uh, it's something you'll have to be thinking about um, when it comes to deciding where you wanna go study and making sure that there will be a relevant supervisor for you, um, but it's not an expectation that come the time of, of an interview or when you've submitted your application, in a few weeks time that you're able to say who your, who your supervisor potentially could be. Um, transcripts, you should upload all of your transcripts for any academic uh, history you have, postgrad, undergrad, any of them. Um, any higher education degrees you should upload a transcript for. Um, if you're finding that you haven't got enough space to upload them all, then uh, you can always, I suppose, combine a couple of them to the last, I think there's an option to upload three, um, combine a couple of them to the last and upload them in one go. If you have any issues, let me know and I can try and sort it out um, at the admin end of the platform. Um, if you're unsuccessful, you can always apply again. There's no limit to the amount of times that you can apply for the John Monash Scholarship. Um, and to that end, it's very important that you always seek as much feedback as possible because we do have many scholars that applied more than once before they were successful. So it's, uh, it's definitely important that you take those opportunities to get the, the feedback when you can. So if, if you apply this year and, you, and you're not successful and you, for whatever reason, I mean, you, you possibly can't go overseas and do the study without the funding. So you put it off for a year and then you apply again. There, there's plenty of people who've been in that situation before and there's, there's no, negative to being a return applicant either. Um, if you want to talk about that in more detail, I'm happy to have a, a chat. Yeah, and, and um, you can find that you're often successful after having a few sort of goes at the experience. You know, you're better for the, better for the run and, and understanding how it all works and, and sort of having the time to reflect and, and grow your proposal can be a huge advantage. Um, someone's mentioned potentially talking to alumni. Yeah, the John Monash scholars are all quite generous with their time when it comes to assisting with the application. So if, if you're finding that you do want a bit, a bit more guidance from someone who's been through the process, you can get in touch with me directly and I can try and make a connection for you. Keeping in mind that obviously a couple of weeks to go before close of applications, um, it probably would be more of a, a casual chat opposed to getting you know, a lot of guidance from them. Um, and keep in mind as well that they might be very busy and a bit of a lag in getting back to you. So if it's something that you desperately want answered, I'd suggest putting it to me first, but then more than happy to make connections uh, to alumni, of course, and, and they are all very generous with their time when it comes to helping out with uh, potential applicants as well. Uh, the panelists are different in every state and territory. 
So every panel has a different group of six to seven individuals. Uh, to answer that query there from Hannah. Yeah, and all of the all of the panelists are from you know a variety of of fields of endeavour and all very high up in their professions and and have a real understanding of what we're looking for in in our scholars and and have either done it several times before or have been involved in our process or recommended by someone who really understands our process. So it's um it's a very uh, it's a very rewarding thing to go into. I think the panels and have the opportunity to have people who are really interested in, in what it is that you are proposing you would like to do. So it, it's, it doesn't need to be seen as a, as a really intimidating process, but more an opportunity for you to draw out um, what, it, what your passions are and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, the interviews at the state are 20 minutes plus five minutes Q&A. And then at the national, I'm just gonna double check, I think it's then 25 and then plus five minutes Q&A. So might have to make this one the last question. So postgrad study proposal, should I talk about the benefits of my, I'm just gonna read this to myself and then answer it. So, okay, if you obviously have two preferences for where you'd like to go study, which is, as mentioned, a very good idea. Um, if one is your clear first preference, then give that the, the fur, like add more detail to that one. If they're equal in terms of you would be very happy to go to either, then you could certainly split um, the detail between the two of them. Um, if you do have one that, that is a clear front runner, then you can provide further detail to that and then mention that you have a second one and why it's also a, a perfectly adequate place for you to go to continue uh, this pathway that you proposed. Okay, so that is all the questions that I've seen in the chat. I hope that I've um, answered everything there. If not, as mentioned, uh, there's always the option of sending them through to us and we can still, uh, we can still answer them for you and as a priority, obviously, given that we've got a couple of weeks to go. Um, so yeah, please, please get in touch with us if we're, um, you know, particularly myself, I'm more than happy to help with any queries you might have. Um, you can send anything through to the, the info address, but just to going back to the first slide, there's my email there, alexandra.quelly at johnmonish.com. Um, so please keep in touch if you're able to help with anything else and hope that this has answered quite a few of your questions today, but best of luck with your applications and yes, please do reach out if you're able to help with anything else.